gracious, the most merciful. Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, dear professors, dear colleagues, peace and mercy and blessings of Allah be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this important discussion panel on women's role in peacemaking an insider perspective from Afghan negotiators. This seminar is part of the regular lectures organized by the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies in Doha with the participation of renowned and influential international, regional, and local personalities in the area of peace building and humanitarian work. Year 2020 is the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 which is one of the most important international charters and resolutions that contributed to shedding light on the exceptional role of women at various local, national, and regional levels to prevent conflicts, build peace, and carry out mediation and post-conflict recovery efforts. Women's studies in context of conflict and war. The, the studies of the role of women is one of the uh, items on the agenda of the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies. Human Art Peace Project was launched in September 2020 under the umbrella of the United Nations Forum for Global Governance, UN75 and it is the in celebration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. This project aims at building a series of networks with representatives from civil society, NGOs, in addition to research centers, experts, decision makers at the local, regional, and international levels. The project focuses on four war-torn countries, Yemen, Libya, Sudan, and Afghanistan. The center gives particular attention to providing specialized knowledge in conflict studies and humanitarian work in Arabic. And although we have uh, to have our discussion in English to facilitate the dialogue with our uh, guests and also we have translation from Pashtun to English but we also have translation into Arabic and this session is going to be broadcasted on the social media accounts and the YouTube account. Professor Sultan Barakat, the founding director of the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies, is going to moderate this uh, session. And uh, he's a graduate of uh, York University, where he installed and managed the unit for building uh, the post-war areas. In 2012, he joined Brookings Institute uh, as a uh, visiting researcher, and then he became the director of the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies. He has an expertise in various academic and uh, professional fields, conflict management, rebuilding and reconstruction, and managing transitional periods. Welcome, dear guests, and we would like to thank you for being here with us, and we would also like to welcome all our, our guests who are watching us in English and Arabic through broadcasting and we will be happy to receive your questions through your comments. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, shukran jazeelan Maisa. Thank you very much Maisa. I do apologize about the headsets. They're not working. So we will discount this from our costs when we settle the bills. But uh, for now, uh, I do apologize. Uh, basically, Maisa uh, gave uh, an introduction to what we are here for and linked our event to a broader project that we are doing at the center. It uh, uh, has to do with the empowerment of women in mediation, uh, and it is linked to the United Nations 75 agenda, which I had explained to you, I think, uh, earlier. Thank you very much. 
Shukran. Uh, today is a very special day, and for me, as a, as a male uh, professor, is a very intimidating day, and uh, because I'm I'm not only with um, uh, four uh, outstanding uh, women practitioners, but also they are all uh, uh, have had an exposure to academia, or have engaged with academia, and are some of the most important opinion shapers in Afghanistan. We're very honored to have uh, with us uh, uh, our colleagues. Uh, to my right, immediate right, is uh, Mrs. Fatima Gailani. Uh, Fatima began her career as the spokesperson for the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union in the 1990s. In 2001, she became a member of the Bonn Conference and the following year of the emergency loyal jirga between June 11 and the 19th. She was a commissioner in 2003 and participated in the formation of the Constitution of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan in 2004. After that, for about 11 years, she led the uh, Afghan Red Crescent Society in Afghanistan. And uh, I think she is known as Mama Fatima to a lot of people, people <laughs> including to me. I've known her for many, many years, and I'm very, very uh, honored to have her as a close sister to us. Uh, Fatima uh, is accompanied uh, with, uh, to her right by Habiba Sarabi. Habiba Sarabi uh, became the first woman to ever be appointed as a provincial governor in Afghanistan. Uh, and she was uh, the governor of Bamiyan province starting from 2005. Before that, between 2002 and 2004, she served as Minister for Women Affairs and she taught girls and women in refugee camps in Pakistan. In 2014, she gained prominence as the, as the running mate for Dr. Zalmai Rasul in his presidency elections. She served as an advisor to women and youth, to Dr. Abdullah Abdullah under the National Unity Government, and was then appointed as deputy to the Afghanistan High Peace Council in 2016. The same year, she was awarded a National Peace Prize in Afghanistan. Immediately to my left, Fawziya Kofi is the first Afghan woman to be elected as a second deputy speaker and was heading the Parliament's Women Affairs Commission. In 2001, she began promoting the uh, Back to School campaign, fighting uh, against uh, those who are trying to limit women's rights. And in the following year, she was appointed as the Child Protection Officer under UNICEF. She is the author of Letters to My Daughters. Many of you may have come uh, across this, uh, uh, this book. As a result of her spoke, uh, outspoken activism, which I think our colleagues from, from Afghanistan recognize very well. Unfortunately, she has been targeted a number of times by assassination attempts. Uh, all of them went without uh, discovering who was really behind it. Uh, and the latest uh, was in August, where she was shot and injured in her right arm. In 2005, Fawzia was elected as a member of parliament, earning the highest votes of women candidates across Afghanistan. And in 2020, 2020, she was shortlisted for the Nobel Peace Prize. To the left of Fawzia, uh, we have uh, Sharifa uh, Zormati, who, is, uh, act, who acted as an advisor uh, on uh, relations between civil societies women affairs and government uh, as part of the uh, Mashorna, Mashorno uh, Jerga, which is the upper house uh, equivalent of a parliament, and also a member of the Walisa Jerga or the lower house. In Afghanistan, she, uh, she is a media consultant and spoke, spokeswoman uh, on, uh, uh, for the Women Affairs Ministry. And she was also a commissioner in the Afghanistan Independent Election Commission. Additionally, she is an advisor to the President for Human Rights Affairs. So you can see 
from these very brief bios why discussing issues of women in Afghanistan would be extremely interesting and potentially very complex uh, uh, and full of uh, challenges for us today. To help us organize ourselves, we proposed that we tackle it from four themes because we didn't want it to be only looked at from a gender perspective. From the bios I read to you, you can see that we don't just have women on the panel. We actually have, as I said earlier, opinion shapers, policy makers, parliamentarians, who, to whom peace and reconstruction in Afghanistan goes way beyond the mere definition of male-female. So we thought we will tackle four themes, and each of our uh, panelists will start by giving her view on this specific theme and then uh, we will engage in, in, a, in a wider discussion. The four themes we thought we'd start with, uh, uh, Sharifa uh, Khan, uh, talking about inclusivity in peace building and peace approaches. And inclusivity includes not just inclusivity in terms of opening the opportunities for women, but for many other sectors in the society that have been excluded uh, either because of the context or the time pressure or the way the uh, arrangements have been made, and that could look into issues of minorities, youth, victims, and so on. And then we will move on to Habiba, who will speak uh, specifically on the challenges and the opportunities for women direct participation in reconciliation and peacemaking in Afghanistan, and some of the challenges they faced over the years uh, we will hear that there's been many, many attempts over the years and uh, how those attempts have either, either bear fruit or have been frustrating to those who, who, have und who undertook them. Uh, we will then turn our attention to a very important aspect of religion and the interpretation of Islam in relation to women's roles in society. And this is a subject that is uh, sensitive, and there are different interpretations from different sides to the conflict in Afghanistan as to what degree the limitations that exist are caused by interpretations of religions, or are they just have to do with the traditions uh, and so on. And for that, we're very uh, honored to have uh, Fatima Gailani with us, who, in fact, I have not said this in her bio, but she is also a trained uh, Islamic scholar and uh, she will be addressing uh, those issues. Uh, last but not least, we will turn our attention to uh, Fawzia Kofi to talk about the important issue of the international dimension in relation to the happenings in Afghanistan that has to do with uh, uh, the participation of women in general. Uh, we've asked uh, Fawzia to focus on the issue of the international community, NGOs, donors, etc. Uh, m simply because ever since 2001, they have played an important role in the development uh, overall and reconstruction of the country, and uh, uh, that included uh, women uh, uh, participation and so on. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to start uh, uh, by giving the floor to uh, our sister Sharifa Zermati, uh, who will start by addressing the issue of inclusivity. Each of our panelists will speak for about five minutes. Uh, Sharifa, we've given her uh, slightly more time because we are having, we will provide translation following uh, every two minutes of, of her presentation by our colleague Abdul Warith who's sitting there. Okay, so let's let's start with you, Sharifa. Sharifa Khan. Nahmadhu wa nisali ala rasulihi al-kareem. Ama baat fawz billahi minash shaitan al-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Tulu qadarmanu hazirinuta salamuna au nikihi lidalikum. The Madi uh, program uh, Matan Albata de Tul Shumiliat Pahakla Bandida. The Afghanistan de Suli Muzakirat ya Bainul Afghani Muzakiratu Asli Mucha Pa Hiwatki Talpati Adilana Au Basubata Sulita Residelti. 
د سولې پروسه کې له ښکېلو لورو نه پرته اړینه ده چې د هېواد په کچه د مختلفو اقشارو ګډون او ټول شمولیت چې د سولې پروسې ته روڼتیا وربښي په پام کې ونیسو Hello, hello everyone, uh, and I'm welcoming everyone, all the participants. Uh, today I'll be speaking about inclusivity and the peace process. The main goal of the intra-Afghan talk is to achieve lasting, just, and dignified peace in the country. Other than the main opposing parties involved in the peace process, it is important to consider participation and inclusion of the various groups across the country to bring transparency to the peace process. د خری او کلیوالی او سیدون کو خوند و ورونو دل وستو او نال وستو کسانو گدون داخی چی حقوی دی سولی اصلی مالکین دی. The participation of urban rural residents, whether brothers and sisters, they are literate or educated, uh, in the peace process shows that the Afghans are the real owner of the peace process. د ټول شمولیت موضوع په ملي او نړیواله کچه د تلپاتې او با عزت سولی اعتبار ترلاسه کولی شي. که چیرته د سولې پروسه ټول شموله نه وي د سولې ټینګښت سربېره به تاوتریخوالي ته زمینه مساعده شي او دا چاره د دې لامل کېدای شي چې د هېواد په بېلابېلو برخو کې تاوتریخوالی یو ځل بیا پیل شي د ایشو اف د انکلوسنیس کن ارن د کریډیبلیټي ټو ا لاستینګ اینډ ډګنیفایډ پیس نیشنلی اینډ انټرنیشنلی If peace process is not inclusive, in addition to continuation of instability, it will increase the level of violence. This could lead to resurgence of violence in various parts of the country. The Muzakiratu Padarshalki di Wulusunu di Ghag au Ridil Hawita Wanda Warkawal au Faal Gardun bai di Suli Puruseta la Qanuniyat au Mashruyat Urwubaki. Listening to the voices of people, giving them active participation role, will further legitimize the peace process. موږ قطر ته د دې لپاره راغلي یو چې یو څلوېښت کلنې جګړې ته د پای ټکی کېږدو دا ستر مسؤلیت یوازې د موږ نه دی بلکې د هغوی هم دی چې زموږ په وړاندې قرار لري وی کیم ټو قطر ټو اینډ دس فورټي ون ایرز اف لانګ وار دس ګریټ ریسپانسیبلیټي از ناټ اورز الون بټ اف دوز هو ار اګینسټ اس ټو اینډ دس وار ځوان قشر چې د افغانستان د موجوده بشري ظرفیت اساسي برخه تشکیلوي او د جګړې اصلي قربانیان دي د دوی ګډون د مذاکراتو او سولې پروسې د تطبیق په لاره کې یو حتمي امر دی د پارټیسپیشن اف یونګ پیپل هو ار میجر پارټ اف افغانستان's current human potential and who are the main victims of the war is a must in implementation of the negotiated agreement and in the peace process نننی ځوان نسل چې له سیاسي ټولنیز اقتصادي او فرهنګي اړخه د نوي افغانستان په حقله فکر کوي د دوی فعال ګډون او شمولیت د سولې پروسې تضمین کولی شي Today's young generation is politically, socially, economically, and culturally thinking about new Afghanistan. Their active participation and inclusion can guarantee the success of the peace process. The tool shumula suli di paiyakht au tatbiq la para di simi au hiwat pa kacha di dini alimano, khazu, madani tulano, siyasi ahzabu, di jagri qurbanyano, ma'lulino, قومي شوراګانو استادانو محصلینو او لګکی ونډا د مذاکراتو پروسه کې اړینه ده د پارټیسپیشن اف ریلیجیوس سکولرز وومن سیول سوسایټیز پولیټیکل پارټیز ویکټمز اف وار د ډیسپلز د ټرایبل کونسل ټیچرز سټوډنټس اند مینورټیز اکراس د کانټری از ایسینشل فور د سستینابلیټي اف د پیس اند امپلیمنټیشن اف انکلوسیو پیس د جګړې قربانیان چې هر چا نه زیات زوریدلی او مایوسه شوی دي د مذاکراتو په جریان کې باید د ځانګړي رسمي او غیر رسمي میکانیزمونو له مخې په مذاکراتو کې حضور ولري ویکټمز اف وار هو سفرد اند د موست اند فرسټریټد مور دن انی ون ایلس مست بی پرزنټ ډورینګ د نیګوشیشن ترو سپیشل فورمل اند انفورمل میکانیزم خزي او لګکې چې تل د جګړې قربانی شوی دي د دوی فعال ګډون په هیواد کې د عادلانه تلپاتې او با عزت سولې تضمین کولی شي women and minorities who have always been victims of war their active participation guarantees a just lasting and dignified peace in the country نړیوال تحقیقات خی چې د خزو فعال ګډون د مذاکراتو پروسه کې د سولې پروسې ته قوت پایښت او سپېڅلتیا ور بخښلی شي International research shows that the active participation of women in negotiating process gives strength, sustainability, and integrity to the peace process. 
د خزو فال ګډون په پریکړو او فیصلو کې د باسوبات او عادلانه سولې لپاره زمینه مساعدوي د اکټیو پارټیسپیشن اف وومن ان ډیسیژن میکینګ پیوز وی فور دی سټیبل ان جاست پیس موږ د هیواد په کچه د بیلا بیلو ډلو خزو او مدني ټولنو سره کتلی دي لکه د افغانستان د خزو واحد غګ ګروپ د افغانستان د خزینه خبریالانو ګروپ د افغانستان د خزینه استادانو او محصلینو ګروپ د خزینه امنیتي سکتور ګروپ د خزینه دینی عالمانو ګروپ د خزو د حقونو د فعالینو او مدني ټولنو ګروپ او د بشري حقونو د مدافینو ګروپ وی هاو میټ ویت ورز وومنز ګروپس اکراس د کنټری Uh, the Afghanistan's Women uh, United Voice Group, Afghanistan's Women Journalist Group, Group of Female Teachers and Students of Afghanistan, Women's Security Sector Group, Group of Female Religious Scholars, Group of Women's Rights Activists and Civil Society Activists, Human Rights Women a Human Rights Defenders Group. Madani Tolani Chidi Wilsonu Termanz Di Awali, Amapu Havi, Khuwanizu, Warak Shapunu, Aw Konferansunu Lalari Faliyat Kavi, د ځنګړي میکانیزم له مخې مذاکراتو څخه وړاندې د مذاکراتو په جریان کې د مصالحې د عالي شورا د مذاکرې د حیات او د ولسونو سره په ملي او محلي کچه فعالیت کوي سیول سوسایټي ویچ ورکس فور انټر ایتنیک یونیټي پبلک اویرنس ایجوکیشنل ورکشاپ اینڈ کانفرنسز هاز ا سپیشل میکانیزم ان پلیس بیفور اینڈ ڈورنګ نیګوشیشن اینڈ ورکنګ ویت دا ہائی ریکنسلیشن کاونسل Uh, the negotiating team uh, and with the people at the national level and operates locally and nationally nadewalo taqiqatu da jawata kade da chi de muzakratu aw suli prosaki ulusuna tasmim niwun kidi aw de dui faal gadun ba aw ya fi sada pataw trekhwali aw jagra ki kamakht rawali mana international research sh- uh, has shown that local people are the decision makers in the negotiating and peace process and their active participation will reduce violence uh, and war by 70%. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Zermati. I think uh, it is very clear uh, the emphasis you placed on the importance of the participation, and uh, we shall come back to that. We shall come back to that in our uh, discussion uh, later on. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now move on to our uh, second uh, uh, panelist, uh, Mrs. Habiba Sarabi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barakat. Uh, Honorable Dr. Barakat, dear audience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, uh, let me to thanks uh, from you and also the colleague that made this opportunity to talk about the women issue in Afghanistan and for the peace building, how the women could play a big role for the uh, peace building and reconciliation. Uh, I want to, uh, to share uh, my uh, experience uh, because uh, uh, I am uh, a life memory of the uh, four decades war in Afghanistan. And so uh, because I stayed during all the period I stayed inside Afghanistan, I was not out of the country uh, uh, within this uh, four period, uh, decades. I am graduated from the Kabul University in 1981. The time I was at the school, we had the women am- ambassador, we had the women minister, At the same time, we had the women parliamentarian in both house, uh, uh, upper house and the lower house. So, and the first group of women who went outside the country for higher education was in 1921. Imagine a few months, just a few months short than a uh, hundred years. The era of the uh, internal war in Afghanistan was a period that women suffered a lot. due to all suffer that women had during that time, but still the uh, school were open and women allowed to go out of, uh, out of home for work. Now comes to the uh, Taliban uh, area. During the Taliban, uh, suddenly all women uh, state, uh, um, uh, state uh, pushed back to, to home without 
and even without any close uh, male member, uh, women were not allowed to go out. And all the schools, especially girls' school, were shut down. Uh, women, of course, were not allowed to go out of uh, home without any close uh, uh, male member, which we call it in mahram. But uh, due to the war, uh, um, though we had uh, hundreds of women uh, widows, that they were carrying all the responsibility of, of their families. So after 2001, there was a new window of opportunity open for Afghan women. And the Constitution gives us the equal rights uh, uh, according to the Article 22. However, in the past two decades, we have made significant achievement as compared to the preceding time. 23% of the civilian workforce uh, is made up women. We have 69 women parliamentarian and 19 senator. Women have made and wrote into as assuming position, uh, position as lawyer, and we have at the moment 393 prosecutors, 234 judges, two district governors, five deputy governors, and 59 members of provincial council, among others. In addition to this, we have a ministry dedicated to women's af women affairs. Women have a relatively visible presence in national security and institution, including 4,065 police and 2,800 army, among others. I myself have served for, uh, as a first female or women governor uh, for more than eight and a half years. The NGO, the number of NGO uh, and uh, non-governmental organization increased, and there are tens of NGOs that they are working in the education, health section, and different other, including the conflict resolution and rec reconcil uh, reconciliation and peace education. These achievements are good, but by no, uh, by no means enough and far-reaching we have to keep st st striving for more. Yet since the commencement of the Afghanistan peace negotiation, women have expressed heightened concern related to pre preserve the achievement, uh, the achievement of the past two decades. The rights and freedom given to women are time and again, being mentioned as a red, a red line of the, for the uh, 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 for the negotia uh, negotiation. It's not only the government of Afghanistan, but the, uh, the international part partner also stayed with us. This is all good and positive, yet unfortunately there is a tendency to equal women rights in general to women specific and gender related issue in Afghanistan. Both Afghan and our international partner alike sometimes engage in narrative that reduce our role in the peace process to, uh, to gender-related issues. As if that is the, the only reason why we should be present at the table. As almost half of the Afghan Afghanistan population, we have everything to participate in decision-making on issue of the national relevance and at all level. We, have, we feel the responsibility and accountability from the women that they are inside Afghanistan. So that's why we are engaged with them, listen to them, take their concern, their, uh, take their affairs and, and for the better negotiation on the negotiation table. The demands of the women that we are carrying with us is essential rights for women. The essential rights that they are talking about is uh, political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. As the heart of this uh, 
is the fact that we have to work toward making gender equality as a non-negotiable uh, uh, reality. Our message and the women message that we have got from inside Afghanistan. The message that, a strong message we need from your side. A strong message that it will change our future or affect the future of Afghan women. It's not only political message, it, it will be a moral message for us. We need the venue like this to make our voice heard. We need to make it impossible for decision maker uh, and all sides to ignore us. So we need that you stand beside us, not uh, behind us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you also for referring to the fact that uh, women have different experiences in Afghanistan. And over the last uh, 40 years, even 100 years, as you rightly say, that experience has changed a great deal. And I think we'll come back to some of those issues in the discussion later on. Uh, uh, Fatima Gelani, uh, the issue of, of religion and Islam, uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Talab al-ilm farida ala kulli muslim. He didn't say just male muslim, kulli muslim, male and female, and it's a duty to be educated. Can you enlighten us a little bit more about the challenges faced from an interpretation point of view? <coughs> Bismillah rahman rahim uh, uh, good morning, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here. And I thank uh, Sultan, I call you Sultan, if you might may, <laughs> and Maisa for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Islam uh, has a very important role in the life of Afghan people. It has always had, it has today, and it will always have. It's not just for the country, but it, ha it has a special place in the heart of Afghan people. And it's supposed to be a source of unity. It's supposed to unite us. Afghanistan is made of different ethnic groups, different languages, different sects of Islam, but we are hoping, and it's supposed to be a unifying force. It is also true that in the history of Islam, when we come to the women's issue, if it comes to uh, the issue of Islam in the history of Islam, we had strong women uh, like uh, Umm al-Mu'minin Khadija, anh, who was a great merchant as well as a leader. We had Umm al-Mu'minin Aisha, who was a fantastic, uh, eloquent uh, orator, and uh, also a political, and even a military uh, leader. Some people will agree what he, she did in um, Jamal War or disagree, but the fact was that she was leading a political and military action. And Um Salma and so on. It is also true that we had um, imams like uh, scholar or jurist, like uh, um, Imam Ibn Hazm, in the time of Cordoba, which was many, many years ago, who would not put limit to what a woman can do and what is the, the limit of political education-wise or whatever. When you see all this hundreds of years ago in Europe, it, they were far and far from this reality. But we have to acknowledge that it had changed. Very soon, the traditions, wrong traditions even, in the Muslim world were mixed and imposed upon people and especially upon women in the name of Islam. Unfortunately, these traditions were so strong that even our religious leaders and scholars, they hesitated to stand up and and clearly say that this is wrong. They were hesitant. Still, they are hesitant. Imagine, nearly a thousand years after Ibn Hazm, we walked back instead of going forward. 
The impact in my country, and I think in countries like Afghanistan, was that a woman was not allowed to go to the mosque. In Afghanistan, women don't go to the mosque. An Afghan woman outside Afghanistan goes to the mosque, but not inside Afghanistan. And I haven't heard once that scholars will get up and say that this is wrong. In more than 80% of Afghan women, and in, also in countries like around us, women don't even dare to take their inheritance or ask for their inheritance. It is totally at the mercy of their brothers and family if they give this or not. You should not talk about it. Mahar. Mahar, which was supposed to be uh, um, I mean, a support for the future of a woman financially, is taken by brothers and father. It became a price, price on the head of this woman, like a commodity. And no one talked about it because it was tradition. And slowly, families became so strict that educating a woman was not well done. People were ashamed to send their children, daughters, to, to school. In short, this had become the, the, um, the traditions became much more strong uh, than religion. And sometimes it was imposed in the name of religion. I still believe that Islam can be a source of unity in Afghanistan. But it has to be the Islam which is true, the Islam which is universal, and Islam that we all be proud of. It is the duty of women like us, but it is also the duty of scholars, religious scholars in our country, to differentiate between these two and openly and bravely say that what is Islamic and what is tradition, and it has to be separated once and for all. And most importantly, uh, Islam should not be allowed to be a tool of politics in the hand of anyone. The equality, coexistence, tolerance, patience is a very important um, factor to sustain and even to build peace in my country. We must not allow people to use Islam for the source of disunity, for the source of one uh, to subjugate the other. All these values exist in Islam. All these things, and we, we I remember as a child, when, when I first at school, I was studying history. When I heard, uh, when I was reading in history that even a war has a code in Islam, as a child, I was so proud of it. And later, at the age of nearly 50, when I became the head of the Afghan Red Crescent Society, and I again read the Geneva Accord, uh, and those uh, articles in it, which was for uh, the codes of war, I thought, well, it is exactly the same. It's taken from my religion. But is it implemented? Are we sure that it is implemented? I'm not very sure. I'm sorry. In Afghanistan, in the new constitution of Afghanistan, that I had a very small and humble role in it, we tried. We tried very well to merge these universal values and strengthen it with the values of Islam. And it looks nice. It is really practical. It is not something that you forge it and it's not practical. It was in consultation, a wide consultation with the religious leaders in Afghanistan and with uh, human rights uh, advocates with women's advocates, and they were giving us a hard, hard time really to make sure that both exist. In Article uh, 22, as um, Governor Sarabi said, 
is ensure the equality of women um, f for in everything and many other articles. But also in Article 3, it is totally clear that nothing, no rules, no regulations, no law in Afghanistan could be made which is uh, against Islamic law and it has to be according to the Islam. So um, only few things in the law which is uh, regarding the uh, family law, maybe there is a difference between man and woman, but in general, uh, all the universal values is kept in this constitution and I can defend it, or everyone can defend it according to the Islamic law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you also again for highlighting the fact that maybe there is an issue with the implementation and not just the principle, not just the understanding. And of course, uh, uh, although Habiba emphasized the shortcomings under the Taliban, you are kind of referring uh, that implementation may have been wrong even now, still is there are some gaps. In general, yes, we can do. Thank you very much. Uh, we now we'll move on to uh, Fauzia Coffee and uh, uh, discussion around uh, the general issue of international support and NGOs. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Barakat, uh, I would like to thank you and your team for. I thought I will use this to make it more. Could you share? Can you hear me? Uh, but that's okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. I thought I will use this to make it more lively so that um, we are all engaged in this. Uh, thank you and your team for uh, giving um, the woman, the four women, uh, the opportunity to not only speak about uh, what their vision uh, and experience is, but also in a broader term to share their experience of the history and the way forward, because we are at a critical time of our history. Um, I would like to basically speak from my heart because that's what I do. I think there is, a, there is something missing in our international discourse and that is heart to heart, emotional conversation, bringing ground realities. As a leader, we shouldn't really uh, stick ourselves to the intellectual um, analytical lectures but uh, come from the ground realities and experience and share that and make uh, ourselves resonate to what uh, we can contribute to. Um, uh, to put ourselves into each other's shoes and to listen to what we can do as, uh, in, the, in, the, in the cause of humanity. Uh, going back a little bit, if you allow me, Dr. Barakat, to our history, uh, when I was uh, absolutely very little ch child, or maybe even not born, when um, the jihad started in Afghanistan, and uh, as a result of the, also the Cold War, uh, a lot of international community, some of uh, you also represent them, uh, the countries, the world uh, community, started uh, supporting the Mujahideen, which was a great thing to do then. But there was blank checks given to them without um, ensuring certain benchmarks are monitored in terms of uh, human rights, women rights, um, you know, uh, how the money is uh, spent basically to promote the cause of humanity. Because that's what people do in the war. Uh, the, in, the, in the war which the culture is war is also not respected, let's focus on the human aspect of it. Um, so as a result of that, the blank checks were mainly spent not only in the war, but some of it was spent in uh, some of these uh, institutions which produced more radical views. Um, uh, uh, we call them madrasas. Um, uh, without their curricula being uh, monitored, reforms brought to the curricula, as, an is, as a result, uh, many of the Afghans who either migrated, went as a refugee to study in these neighboring countries where the jihadi leaders were uh, there basically, they become more radical in their views in terms of the, uh, the situation in Afghanistan, but mainly women and human rights, which is not something that uh, has got a deep that got deep roots in Afghanistan before that. Yes, the governments had their policies in terms of uh, these issues, but 
there has always been certain level of liberties that people enjoyed. Uh, there was no control of what a woman wear or what a man wears or, wh or how the education system should be or how much the, 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 the measurement of a, a, bear should, a bear should be. While this was actually the practice later on, the, the people clothing was uh, monitored, the measure of a, a beard was measured. I think that it started back then. It started back then, and then people of Afghanistan paid the consequences. Now, post-2001, we are in a war of perspectives. We have extreme interpretation and definition of different perspectives. I give you a few, few examples. The international community presence in Afghanistan, NATO slash uh, peacekeeping missions, which came to Afghanistan as a result of Security Council resolution in 2001. Many Afghans, I, I don't say all, many Afghans regard them as freedom fighters who help people of Afghanistan to be allowed to use their basic rights, including some of which my sisters mentioned, the right to go to school, the right to be able to, f to walk freely without the fear of being beaten up being whipped. So many people call them as freedom fighters. They regard them as freedom fighters. There is another perspective towards that. The other perspective is that they are invaders, that they have destroyed our country, that they have killed many people, that they have misbehaved. We are in a war of perception. The same for women. And it's not only towards Afghan women. I think it's the West, some Western world versus Eastern world people who will say the Muslim woman, in, the, in this case, the Afghan woman, the woman who have, um, who use uh, the opportunities less, they're less progressive, they're less open-minded, and they're extreme. Well, if you look at that perspective from an Afghan, or even in a broader term from a Muslim perspective, the perspective is that they are progressive, that they use opportunity, that there are more doctors, engineers, journalists, even leaders, political leaders that lead some countries, some Muslim countries in the Muslim world. So we are in a war of perspectives. Now, there is a third perspective, which we often see ourselves uncomfortable putting ourselves there. It's a third perspective. It's a third room that we have to really put ourselves. It's a room that is not really comfortable. It's a room that we have to have a third definition, a more moderate definition of things. More moderate definition of our perspectives towards situation. And that is a new generation, I think across the globe, but mainly in Afghanistan, who would like to pursue their moderate, gener their moderate views, their moderate understanding of the situation. That moderate view is being less represented. And I think moving forward in terms of peace process, the international community, because this war in Afghanistan has a multi-dimensional, it is not a civil war. It's a war of perspectives. It's a proxy. Afghanistan has been used as a proxy battlefield to accommodate people with different views, different perspectives. Now, we are here in Doha, not only the, the four women, uh, we have some wonder, wonderful men who have joined us today, two of them here, some of them were not able to join, to introduce that third perspective. And that is, we can have different views to the extreme that we are willing to kill ourselves under the name of suicide bombing or kill other human beings just to pursue our views. While we can pursue our views in a non-violent means. We can sit across the table from each other, talk, agree to disagree. It is okay if we disagree, but let's agree to have a broader space, like a broader cake where everybody will have their share. I know that some of my colleagues, some of my friends, I would say, who are in Doha, under the name of Taliban, they have a complete different understanding of the situation than I do, than most people in Afghanistan do, because it's a new Afghanistan with new ideas completely transformed. 
represented by its women, by its young, younger population. For people who sit here across the waters, across the mountains, in this country, in this beautiful, luxurious life, we need to make them understand that you can still oppose our views, but let us live in a society. Let us let live in our country. You know, the opposition of views should not be the reason for us to kill each other. That should be used as a positive step, as a positive um, aspect of our life because of our country is a country with diversity. It's a country that um, accommodates more than 30 ethnic groups, different school of thoughts, including Hanafi, Jafari, even non-Muslim. We have Hindu and Sikhs. We have also one uh, person with belief of Jewish. So that is the country that has to be respected. Unless we do not respect the diversity and live with it, we will not be able to achieve. And in this, it's not only the responsibility of us, but the responsibility of our friends who work with us in the international community. Because with a peaceful, diverse Afghanistan, we will not only be able to enjoy political friendship, but also economical friendship. Afghanistan is a potential economical hub that will connect Central Asia with South Asia with enormous wealth underground. But yet, a poor nation in terms of access to economical resources. Let us help Afghan people and the country to enjoy what it has with a defined uh, relationship, with a defined friendship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for emphasizing the need to coexist, live with different opinions in, under the same uh, umbrella. I'd, I'd like now to uh, uh, engage in some uh, discussion. And uh, uh, it's very important to acknowledge those who are with us in the room, uh, some of them who, being, who are here really with similar experiences. To start with, our very own Dr. Hindel Muftah, who is a member of our Shura, uh, Qatar Shura Council, and one of four women, first women, no, to serve in the Shura Council. So uh, the, there are a lot of similarities, I think, in terms of uh, conservative society, Islam, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it would be very interesting to hear her views on some of what you've just said. Also on the screen uh, here, uh, we have uh, four of our partners from around the Arab Muslim world who have been engaging with the center for some time and they're part of a continuous discussion around the empower empowerment of women in peacemaking. Dr. Intalaq Al-Mutawakkil from uh, Yemen, uh, Dr. Samia Nihar from Al Khartoum uh, in Sudan, and Rahila Siddiqui from London, who many of you would know as the founder of the uh, Farhuna Trust of Afghan Women Education, and uh, Rania Al Afnak, uh, who is uh, from Libya. Uh, the way we intend to do this is I'll just kickstart the discussion with one question to our panelists, and then we'll start gathering questions from all of you. Those I mentioned, if they'd like to say something or ask a specific question, please uh, type it, and uh, uh, my colleagues will be able to uh, pass it on to me. Uh, the real question here, the difficult one, is that we all seem to be in agreement. And in fact, uh, uh, at the center, we've just commissioned a study by uh, uh, a member of the, uh, a, a scholar, who is also happened to me a member of the Taliban, to look at this issue for our discussion. And what came in this document doesn't differ at all from what you've all said in terms of the rights are there, we should protect the rights, Islam says this, Islam says that. The difficulty is in the application of all this. So if I could start maybe with uh, Sharifa. The, uh, we all agree on the importance of inclusion of women in peace talks, in negotiations, and so on. Why is it not happening to a satisfactory degree? What should happen? What should happen to make this inclusivity uh, genuine? 
and uh, uh, what recommendations would you make and give yourself the liberty to, to make it to both sides. Manana Salamatusi, the Afghanistan per Asasi Kalunke hits the old Mushkil Nasta. Paparaha Kachabandi, the Hazu Wanda, Po Hukumatwaleke, Hamdashan, the Suli, or the Amnet Poporusaki, Per Patama Mamana, Nival Savid of the Arzak to work also it. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, the <coughs> Uh, there is no issue with uh, our constitution, and uh, our constitution guaranteed all the rights uh, for inclusion of the women. Us ham pti prosaki ra sara pa paracha kacha di Afghanistan pa tsalur dil shoula etuni ki pa bila bila sume ki am pa markaz am pa ulas walui ki ra sara mirmani di suli pa prosaki ham kariti. Even now, in all the 34 provinces, women are involved in helping in peace process, and they are included. پدی بر خاکی آوازی مگنیو بلکه دی افغانستان مدنی طول نی تکه زوفالی نی طول پدی بر خاکی را سرم رست کی. We are not only on the one, but all the Afghan activists and civil societies are helping us for the inclusion of the peace process. مگه دی مذاکراتو دی پایل نمخ که هم پا افغانستان کی دی بیل ابیلو طول نو لخ زو سر ل نزدی نه حضوری بنا بنا بندی ملاقات نکردی. Uh, before the process, the peace process, we already met uh, with uh, different uh, women societies, uh, virtually uh, about the inclusion of women. No doubt that the inclusion of women is very critical and important. هاگان اسام دودن دیسی پا افغانستان کلا تروس پوری داد زمینه ندا مسایل دیسی خزی پا پراخه کچه باندی وندا وقت. But the main issues, challenges for the women are the first table is insecurity and the other is the cultural malpractices that is not allowing women to participate. زیاد اومد دنیش رو لانه وس دام مسئولیت اخیسته دیسی دی مرکز پلازمینی دی لری پرتوسی متا ولس ولی ولایاتو تا. ولارسی اول تا دستوری پروسه که دخزو دیپار نیا وازی بلکه دورونه دیپار هم دیاما پو خوی پو برخه کی لامک سرام رسته اوکی. Most of the civil society is now going beyond the capital couple and reaching far countryside and to not only include women but even men in the peace process. اما استون زدی دیپ خطر بند زیاد دیسی دی تالبانو لطرف حقاسی میسی دی دیپ اول که کدی پا حقاسی مکی پو وقت سر مگه نسک ولای لاس رسای ولر. But the issues are uh, rise more when it comes to the areas where are under control of Taliban. We really cannot go there and cannot do much there and cannot reach them. Like I said, I'm not sure if the Sule Purusaya was a Demugla Tarafna Mahtanisitlai, but the Hagalore Sile Muksara Pomakabilke, the Yani Taliban, the Kapagada Wokawala ICC, but the Sumuki, the Hazu, the Shumulet, the Para, the Dui, the Pohavi, the Para, the Dui, the Faliatuni, the Para Zamina Masaideki, the Atiafi said the Stunza Halkidalesi. As I said earlier in my speech, that's not our responsibility, but the responsibility of the other side. And the Taliban, if they help us in inclusion of uh, women in the peace process and to let us or let their women to have awareness programs and trainings, that will be helping us up to 80% to have a success rate. موقع تقریبا پرتول ولایاتو که هم دی آما پوهایی پروگرامونا دی خزو دی اندیکنو دی 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 ولان دی زنو پروگرامونا دی پارا. آنلاین دی زوم لالاری که ولی سیستم تماس منی ولی ده آو دیگر طول استون زی ماوری دلیتی. We already contacted women and and listened to their concerns and and their voices through Zoom and through online meetings in all over the countries. تقریبا یاو یاو نیم کال مخ که دی ملی جماع دی خزو دی ملی جماع پنوم بندی پینزل زر کسب شاخوا که خزینه و دی سولی دی پروسی دی اوربان دی تطبیق دی پر اپرگرامونا پلا را چولیو. Uh, under the national consensus, uh, around 15,000 women launched the uh, program in supporting the peace process. And, and this process is still continued. But we hope the, 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 the other parties that it's at, at war with us help us to implement and include women in the process. 
د زدکړو نه لري پاتې شوي دي another big issue is because women are kept away from uh, education manana thank you very much if you can please respond to the issue of uh, security because security is often used as the excuse why we cannot offer full freedom uh, full rights to to women because we're living in a war the war has its limitations security is is difficult uh, to allow women to access and so on uh, is that the case and and how, what do you think about it in terms of how can we address uh, this particular argument um earlier i said that uh, many things are right um, and put very nicely in our constitution if naturally because of the lack of uh, security some schools are closed and um, some women or even boys they can't go girls and boys they can't go to school this is understandable but when it is made as an excuse uh, not to allow uh, girls to go to school then it is wrong um this is what i was referring earlier that um islam should not be made as an excuse uh to prevent um, girls to go to school um for me when uh, many years ago um in london i was sitting that i heard that uh, girls schools were closed in the name of uh, lack of security in the cities and uh, in the name of islam for me it was a shock a religion which it starts uh, it starts by iqra and al maqalam how could how could you even think of uh, closing schools and then if the excuse was that um, there is no um, security it's then the name of secu- lack of security the schools are closed then the same people were um claiming that in their time security of afghanistan was intact so for me uh, which one is true um so this is what i uh, makes me uncomfortable all right thank you very much uh dr hind would you like to share with us your views on what you've heard so far Yeah, okay. Thank you, Dr. Sultan, and thank you very much the four distinguished ladies for the very interesting uh, experience uh, we've been listening so far. Um, personally, and based on the many, many research studies and even the experiences around the world, I, I believe very strongly that the realities of the women, the status quo of the women, the challenges, and generally it's always the same wherever we are coming from, regardless the... Uh, you know, any other uh, aspect of challenging. However, when it comes to peace uh, making, just to share with you this experience, um, last year I attended similar uh, event at the United Nation, um, just before the corona. And one of the issues that was raised and discussed um, in this workshop by the, the, I mean the be- by the male ladies and also the male who attended this workshop is that the main chal- challenge that women face in the peacemaking is that I think Sharifa, she uh, raised this one and she stressed, uh, stressed it, as the uh, excluding of women in the pre-negotiating dialogue, which uh, really affected not only the policy-making process, but also the quality of the end results, uh, specifically in terms of its uh, content and intents and how does it really targeting the main stakeholders of the society, including, of course, the women, minorities, indigenous, and so on. So my question, do you think that having, you know, such equal rights, you know, whether it was granted by constitutions, uh, NGOs, human rights, whatever, talking about, you know, let's say healthy society that really grant women their human rights in terms of equal equality. So do you think that having such challenge, which I still believe it happens everywhere in the world, it has to do with culture rather than regulations and laws? 
And I'm really so sorry because I really have to leave. But I will be listening to you both <laughs> and get the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hind. It's a very good point to leave us with because, in fact, it's another, uh, there's a question uh, online uh, related to the same issue. And uh, it basically says that uh, there seems to be a, a conflict between traditions and Islam. And you, be, you seem to be torn between uh, adhering to your traditions or using Islam, and uh, you refer to moderate views of Islam and so on. I'd like maybe, uh, Fauzia, you start by addressing this issue. What can be done to overcome those traditions? And uh, from the description that was given so far, it has predated the, the, the Taliban, even the, the jihad to some extent. Uh, what would you recommend? What are you suggesting for a major change now? Okay, um, I would uh, uh, stress three things, and uh, that three thing is education, education, education. Because only by educating the society, not only educating women, but also educating the men in a society that we can reach to an, an environment where we have a true understanding of not only Islamic belief, but also true understanding of our cause and our purpose. Uh, <clears throat> I think um, 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 when I speak of education, it's not you know, the education, the regular education that we are referring. I know that there are Muslim women, and many Muslim women probably will hear us, and Muslim men. Um, Islam has been interpreted by mostly main scholars. We do not really have, um, to the extent that we need, women scholars to interpret Islam for us. So whatever I hear from a man, and in many cases, actually, it has been, uh, the, the religion has been used to empower politically also. So in many cases, they use it their own version of interpretation. And that version of interpretation differs from one individual to the other. However, I don't think, uh, to, to relate it to what the situation in Afghanistan is, I don't think in Afghanistan actually it's, a, it's a, an Islamic, it's a war that has to do with belief or ideology. Uh, I think it's a political war. Um, and, and the major victim of this war has been, the, the, the women have been the major, major victim of war. And moving forward, Probably this peace process is one of the unique pr peace processes in the world where the women rights and human rights probably will be uh, an agenda item for discussion. If you look at the Colombia peace, of, uh, peace process, if you look at the Northern Ireland, even the uh, you know, other peace process including Nepal, uh, people do not, the two warring groups do not discuss uh, these issues. But here it makes it very unique because we will be discussing, this is going to be one of the agenda items, although in, from you know, the Republic side, we have a constitution which Article tw uh, Third, as uh, my sister said, clearly uh, specify no laws in contradiction with Islam. Article 22, then equality, um, and then there wa has been actually a total uh, research about uh, our constitution by, uh, by ulama, and it has been clear that this is one of the Islamic yet progressive constitution in the region. So uh, although we have a guideline, which is our constitution, but moving forward, uh, this is going to be one of the issues for discussion. And that's why I think women engagement, as Dr. Hind mentioned, in pre-negotiation, during negotiation, during implementation of the agreement is essential. It's not just for decoration and for symbol. And I think one of the achievements of the delegation that uh, both sides, delegation, I would say is the woman present beyond symbolism in this negotiation. We have been here for above more than, um, a little bit more than two months, and uh, the women of Afghanistan have proved that they are beyond symbolism, that they are in-depth involved, and I think it's also for us. I would like to make a statement here that will resonate with my sisters. Um, it's also for us to make, uh, to get rid of these uh, predefined boundaries. You no, know, we have certain boundaries that uh, we def commit ourselves to, to. We have to really go beyond uh, the red uh, kind of uh, zones for us, the predefined zones. So peace and security is not something that a lot of women are interested. 
it's a new area. We have to, if we really want to make a change, we have to enter the no entry zones. We have to enter where we are needed, but we are not present. And this is one of the most challenging job, I would say, of my above 20 years of career, but yet more pleasant because at the end of it, you see that you have made an impact. So therefore, woman engagement is key in these processes. Uh, Habiba, the no entry zones. I think you were the one of the first to enter a no entry zone by assuming the role of a governor in, in Afghanistan and in a very important area. Uh, how, how, how would you address this issue again? I have in front of me here uh, a quotation from the speech or speeches from Mullah Omar, of the head of the founder of the Taliban. Mullah Omar seems to have made 11 references directly to women and women participation in politics and so on. And this is a document that was put together, as I said, by a, a scholar who is related to the movement. Uh, and all of them uh, are, are pro-women. It is about you know, uh, preventing violence. It is about allowing education, but within a context that is appropriate for a woman. And that's where we enter, I think, the interpretation and the perspective. What is appropriate for, for a woman? And, and so on, and all the other religious uh, uh, rights that were referred to by Sister Fatima have actually been at one stage or the other referred to. So there's a, a great deal of commonality, I think, in, in what is, at least in terms of rhetoric, what is being said. From a practical point of view, as someone who served as a governor and so on, what is it that we need to do? Is it enough just to make sure that women are part of committees? Uh, is it sufficient that we do education? What more do you think needs to be done to ensure that the qualitative uh, participation of women is, is there, and it is benefiting the whole society, of course, uh, considering that they're already 50% of the society, but they're also the mothers educating the other 50% as it comes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Barakat. Uh, uh, first, about education. I, uh, this is something that I always using that if we, about education on women, and if, if, I mean, Rahila Siddiq also knows about that. Uh, if I, this is something that I'm focusing that if we educate a man, we educate a person. If we educate a woman, we educate a, a family uh, and a society. That's why the education for women is very, very important. So how to enter beyond the entry zone? So first of all, uh, the women should invest on their capability to promote themselves, to get more education, to, uh, to get higher education. Unfortunately, the, the boundary for women in Afghanistan is, is very tight. So women most of the time cannot go from that boundary that uh, mostly uh, made by, by a member of the uh, family, a male member of the family. So that's why education for both is very important, but. Uh, Sometimes, uh, not only as my sister said, that education, regular education at the school or university is not enough. We have to change the mindset of the people. The mindset of the people, especially uh, the mindset of men, is very important. Because women are, are uh, at, at home most of the time. So if uh, the uh, male member of the family cannot support women, it's sometimes, it's very difficult, especially with the traditional society like Afghanistan, that they can promote themselves. This is, uh, this is another thing. About the, um, uh, the prop, uh, proper uh, place that women can get, and it was something uh, from Mullah Omar, that if we women can stay that, okay, it will, it, uh, the proper time will arrive, the proper time will never arrive. We have to work ourselves. We have to uh, uh, invest. The family should invest on their uh, uh, daughters and girls' education that uh, this uh, uh, proper time can be arrived with their knowledge, with their experience, and their capability. 
And uh, of I'm, I'm not very sure that uh, during uh, the Taliban time, I was uh, teaching at the intermediate medical school. And so we have been paid as, as a teacher, we have been paid. Uh, so there was enough budget and enough uh, resource that we could get it, but uh, the, all the doors were shut down. Uh, it was not something that we could wait to the proper time should come. Uh, that's uh, very important that we have to make this, the environment uh, proper for ourselves. So what, what you're saying, if I understood you correctly, in the days of the Taliban when you were at the medical school, it wasn't an issue of resources. The money was still available, yes. but it was a choice. They've made a choice to not educate, or they allowed to ed education of, of a small number of uh, doctors? No, no women uh, could go to school, but for the medical doctor, uh, the, at the recent time, uh, only one of the uh, um, uh, women general, General uh, Suhaila, and she used to be the Minister of uh, Health uh, after that, she was pushing to have only a small group of uh, a woman for, edu for the medical education, only 25, I think, or uh, something uh, more than 20. That's the only. But all the other schools were closed uh, for, for girls. Very interesting. If we, uh, I ask this in relation to how the international community has supported uh, or hindered this change in, 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 in culture over the years, that uh, were they uh, really, did they show sufficient understanding of these cultural uh, dimensions, the limitations on women's participation and address them head on? Uh, were they diplomatic in addressing them with the Taliban? Were there too many compromises made in those days? Um, let me to share some of my experience with the international support for women. Sometimes the international support, to be honest, it's, uh, uh, it's beyond the culture. So I can give you a, an example. Um, so that's why it was a kind of, sometimes it was a kind of reaction from the community level, especially for the, on the rural area. Uh, I was the Minister of Women's Affairs with the um, uh, uh, former President Karzai. We were in Washington, D.C. And there, were, uh, there was a bill of uh, $5 million for women promotion. Uh, or women empowerment. It was just a bill. And two years later, the President Karzai asked me that what uh, happened to that bill and that money. I said, as a Minister of Women Affairs, I don't know that where is that money. So because the money that they wanted to, to, uh, to send it in different area, of course, without any transparency. This is sometimes that the international community, we are very grateful, uh, grateful for the, all the support that international community gave us or supported us, but it should be with the consultation of the people who are uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the community level and they understand all the, the matter, the challenges, the difficulties, uh, the progress. Thank you so much. Well, uh, now I'd like to open the floor for, for questions to our panelists, including uh, from our uh, colleagues who are on, linked to us on Zoom from Khartoum, Yemen, and uh, elsewhere, Libya. Uh, if you have any question, please address it to us. And while you are thinking of the questions, I will call on, on uh, my uh, professor, Dr. Abu Hamel Effendi, is still here? Just left? Oh. It's a shame because he is uh, he's into political uh, Islam and he would have helped us understand better some of this concept. Uh, anyway, well, let's take questions. At your microphone, let's see. Was, uh, in fact, uh, very interested to hear about this uh, export of the balance. In fact, uh, I think, uh, my name is Wael Shadi from Humanitarian Funds. Okay, the, uh, I think the most thing which has attracted my attention the all uh, issue of perceptions in Afghanistan. And the sister told us that there are many different perceptions and there's a war of perceptions according to her definition. 
I think uh, that's right. We know there's a lot of ethnics in Afghanistan, maybe different. Uh, but Islam is uh, the, the common religion of Afghanistan, as our sister said. And Islam should unify us instead of like making differences between us. And yes, I agree with it. It's not in Afghanistan. Many countries that traditions are imposed in Islam. This is unfortunate. It's what's happening. But I think if you uh, if you if you talk from point of view of perceptions, there should be a base for Afghani people. And I think a sort of national constants should be difficult to be the base for any perception. Without this we will still have in different perceptions, then different differences, then conflict. I think there is should be like sort of effort to be paid to develop this national constant in order to develop a national perspective. Of course, that doesn't mean we don't have sub-perspectives, but all the, the, the national perspective, perspective, the sub-perspectives or perceptions should be based on something you agree on, which let's call it on the, uh, the national uh, constants. It should be developed, of course, from Islam, from the traditions, from uh, different experiences, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take two more questions. Anyone from the audience here? Intilak, I cannot see if she's behind me. Intilak, can you ask your question? Unmute. I would like to thank the Arab Center, Dr. Sultan Maisa. And I would like to thank you for inviting me to participate in this important seminar with the presence of our sisters from Afghanistan. They have, undoubtedly, they have vast experience and we will benefit from listening to what they have to say. I have two questions. My name is Intilaq Tawakkul from Yemen. Can I speak? Can you hear me? My question, I have two questions. My first question is, uh, one of our Afghani sisters has uh, said that there is no issues with the Constitution as such. There are no articles which discriminate against women. I wanted to ascertain that because we, in our current Constitution in Yemen, we still have a number of uh, articles which uh, cause problems because all legislation should be based on Islam and uh, women's rights have been uh, limited and uh, referred back to uh, Muslim scholars, and we know they are by and large men, and they have their own interpretation. And this is, of course, reflected in the national laws and legislation. I don't know if this is causing any problems in Afghanistan, so far as the Afghani constitution is concerned. 
My second question, uh, have any women activists used any mechanisms to negotiate and engage with Taliban? And uh, was, was it based on an Islamic perspective? What's your experience in this regard? Shukran jazeelan and talaq. Those two questions so that we can address them as a panel. Please feel free, any of you, to, to come in. The first one is, is again, is, is related to perceptions. Uh, the point was made clearly that the Constitution is okay. There is some re there are good references in the Constitution. But the problem we have is that the other side does not recognize that Constitution. So uh, are there conscious uh, efforts to work on building a, a consensus with the other side? And it relates to the second part of the question of Intalaq. Has the women of Afghanistan tried to have direct uh, uh, dialogue with the Taliban on, on these issues? And uh, a third part is in Yemen, it seems to be the same issue that you referred to, that it is male-dominated, the discussion. Uh, and even al-ulama, al those who are uh, religious scholars and so on, uh, are there efforts to build uh, a momentum of female religious scholars? And I will add to this, maybe, uh, what role is the international community playing in that? Are they accepting that there is a need for this? Is it going uh, according to your wishes or not? So who would like to start? And then uh, we will be concluding. Uh, it, this is a very important uh, question because in every country uh, the, the constitution and the laws are the base to guarantee the future of a subject uh, that uh, the uh, people of the country. And here in Afghanistan, women and also minorities are, uh, it's extremely important that we have it right uh, in the laws and especially in the Constitution, so it is a guarantee. So slowly, more peace is um, achieved, and also in the capital and in the big cities, which uh, contains a majority of people, more than half of the population of Afghanistan, this law is implemented there. It's in the uh, far um, areas that it is not. That's why I say it again that just saying that this constitution is not a good constitution, it's not right, is not enough. I want to hear exactly where in the constitution you have a problem and on what base. So this is a matter of conversation that let's converse and talk about it. Um, so um, whether it is in Afghanistan, whether it's in, in Yemen, we all suffer from the same uh, problem. But uh, this constitution, uh, we didn't just sit in Kabul and, uh, and just wrote it. It was a huge consultation in all over Afghanistan. It was a huge consultation with uh, Islamic scholars outside Afghanistan and inside Afghanistan to make sure that this is a constitution which guarantee equality, tolerance, uh, inclusion, as well as being totally in the boundary of Islam. Uh, I'm totally agree with my sister Fatima uh, Gailani, uh, but uh, if uh, the other side will not accept the constitution, of course there should be some base that to talk. If they are not accepting the constitution, Let's talk, uh, I can call upon to them that uh, let's come to talk on the sake, uh, sake of people. Why, if they have the agreement with the US, why they are killing the innocent people inside Afghanistan? So this is Afghan people, we are the same, from the same territory. Let's come together to talk about on the sake of people and how we can help the poor people and the innocent people. Okay, uh, thank you all for the important questions about perception. Uh, the phenomenon of different perception is not an Afghan 
product only. It's a global phenomenon. We have uh, we have difference of views uh, to the extent that not only in Afghanistan there is war, um, in Yemen, um, Syria, uh, Sudan. Um, because of the vulnerabilities we have, um, if this vulnerability to this level where there is poverty, in the case of Afghanistan, for instance, there is poverty, uh, uncontrolled long border, uh, you know, conflicting zone with conflicting interests from our neighbors, um, you add to that uh, lit uh, illiteracy, and then um, you know th there is a uh, there is a demand and there is a vulnerability. If you had this level of vulnerability, I think in the rest of the world probably the the level of differences in views could go to to the extent that people will use military extremism. But unfortunately, we are because of our vulnerability, as I mentioned, few of them. But they are not the only uh, that uh, the differences could go to the to the extent that we start killing each other. So it's a global phenomenon. And now, how to build a national consensus? Um, we are here actually for the same cause. And as women, um, uh, we have been, because this also relates to the question from my sister from Yemen, I guess. Um, as women, we have been across the table with, uh, with Taliban. We have discussed with them. And uh, this is something I also mentioned at the beginning. I'm happy to say that, that women presence in the peace talks now have gone beyond symbols. It's not because we need to have women because, uh, uh, you know, uh, international community like it. No, it's because between choices and need, it's a need. It's not a choice anymore even. It's a need to have women. In terms of the national consensus, that's why we are here to build national consensus. Now, nothing is verses of Holy Quran except the Holy Quran. Other things are human uh, elaborations, including our constitution. There is always room for improvement. There is always room for amendments, however, the basis on the which uh, constitution has been developed, as stated by my sisters, um, uh, is a very strong Islamic found, uh, foundation now, uh, with, with, of course, human liberties being ensured there. Now, moving forward in the process, as I said before, nothing is written in the stone so that there is, it's, it cannot be deleted. We can always amend it. We are flexible. But amendments should be in a way, in a formation that will not compromise and undermine uh, the, the political identity of today's Afghanistan. Today's Afghanistan, as I mentioned in the beginning, is diverse, um, is progressive, uh, is willing to world, work with, with international world, with international community, not just as a, re a recipient of aid, but also a country that will, uh, that will be willing to work on partnership, investing, partnership in education, partnership in political uh, uh, arena, in any arena. We are willing to work with the world because only with moderate Islam. This is something the, uh, you know, the, the, one of uh, our previous leaders who was then assassinated, Commander Masood said, he said with moderate Islam, we can live with our people and we can live with, with the world. And I tend to agree to this, only with moderate Islam, we can live with ourselves, with our people and with the rest of the world. Thank you very much. We're uh, running out of time, but uh, I have here an, a question which I think would be very suited for Sharifa to, to tackle. It's a very difficult one. Uh, the question basically says, is the translation working? Can you understand? Yeah. Can, can, you, can you say how the Taliban, uh, or how women in the areas controlled by the Taliban are managing their affairs at the moment. I mean, the assumption is that there are 50% of women in those areas. They get sick, they get treated. Some have different degrees of education, etc. They must have issues of livelihood. Uh, what is happening in those areas? Do we know enough about it? And are there uh, women groups that have mobilized in the same way as they have in Kabul and elsewhere? Well, well. Madana, uh, 
I'm a villager, and I want to give you a perspective from a uh, uh, villager uh, perspective to you. ما ابتدایی ذکری هم پکلی کی کردی؟ او دیگه نورست عالی ذکری می پمرکس کی کردی؟ خود پدی بندی پی پدی بندی پیگم سی اوس دنن نه ترسلیه کالا مخکی یا دیش کالا مخکی یک دکلی زوان او دکار زوان دیر لوی تو پیر لری. I studied my primary uh, education in the village, and then later I moved to the uh, uh, capital. But uh, it's now very dif different than uh, it was 40 years before. لنن تقريبا لس كلا مخي ذكلي تطلعي سوي. في أفغانستان زينو ولا ولا سوالو يتم سفرنا كولا سوي. كاري سفرنا مدرلودو. ده خزو زوان أو في أفغانستان دي لري بروتوسي مو ده خلقو زوان مولا نزي نتصدر لاي سوي كتالي مسوي. Ten years ago, I could go to the villages. I could see women, and I could talk to them from closer, see what's happening to them. فتختنا بعد دو أم سي. تنا أمني سراو ساقي سمي تصير زخبل كلي تهم نسمتلي. This is now I cannot even go not to these areas. I even cannot go to my own village because of the insecurity. فحقسي وكيس تالبان حكيم دي أصلاً خزينة خونزي. Uh, in the areas under the control of Taliban, uh, we don't have even primary schools. Forget about uh, higher uh, secondary schools. There is no access to health uh, services and uh, education. Women have no access to, to any of them. The more our machine la hada ziyata sawi de pakasimuki. The mortality rate of who are children and mothers is very high. Haga sarakuna si las kala ya tika la mahki jur sabi wu aga wus de Taliban la tarafa mah pa kharabi du di. Pa khpala pa loi las bandi aga pa machine pa zariya bandi kharabi wu jara wi. The roads built before is now intentionally destroyed by Taliban and they are destroying it till now. نو فکر و که کلاسی دیگویت دیجوان لمرانی امکانات نبرابری که نو آخویت با دزکر زمینات سنجام مساید است. Think about it. They don't have even the basic rights. How would we? They would have access to education. They don't have like the very basic rights, fundamental rights for living. دخار دخزو دیجوان آو دخزو دیجوان ترمز دیر لوی توپیر موجود ده. There's a big difference between urban and rural areas. Women living there. کلا که دیو کلی والی خزی سر خبری که او یاد تلفن لاری یا هم کلا که پپت باندی یا ولو بالا سر آدی کنی سو په حضوری بنا باندی یا په چادری که یا په په دامیرمانی را قوادو ور سر خبری که او یا کم کلا خبلا دستون زودی پر رازی که بالتا ور سر لیدن که او فکر کنم سی دیر لوی توپیر پروت دار. When we are somehow finding ways or secretly finding them and talking to the villagers, villager women, we see the big difference between us living in the cities and them living in the villages. هاوی اتا دسولی پروسیتا دی مذاکراتو پروسیل هم با خبر ندی. They are not even aware of the peace process. They don't have any understanding of it. کسای هم سی مدنی چولانو دیدی دی پردازی ری زمینا مسای دکریده یا پپتا یا نیمه کارا ورته کار کریده. Even though civil societies worked with them, tried to be like secret or half in secret somehow through some channels, but still they are facing mounting problems. I want to give you one example. I want to give you one example. کیگی وربندوسی که گسول راستی، آو کیگی سی نورمال حالات دزوان دوام وکی. Sometimes you are asking your question like, is it possible that peace will come and there will be ceasefire? آقا وای وای زنور په هیچ شی نپیگم. صرف ماتا دیما زوی مرنسی، دیما دی کورنی غرای مرنسی، وربندوسی داره تکیفایت کی. He says, I don't know about anything else. I just don't want my child or my son or my brother or family members to be killed. اینه که چی؟ پا افغانستان کی یا تلپاتی او دائمی وربان تا زمین مسای دنیسی سول پروسا پوآقی بنا بندی تطبیق نسی دخاری خز زوان با نور هم دستون ز سر مخمرسی. Says if there is no ceasefire and no we don't reach the peace agreement, the situation of women will deteriorate further. 
هم دغه یو موقع د زمینه مسایده سوی ده سکچیری دوار لوری د مذاکری غری په واقعی بنا باندې طالبان دې ته حاضر سی سی ور باندې کې بیا په هغه صورت کې د بشری مرستو دی پاره د تلپات سولې دی پاره زمینه مسایده دلیش Here is a chance if, uh, if Taliban honestly work with us and agree to a ceasefire, then it will, we will have a chance to go and uh, for opportunities to improve their life. Manana. Thank you very much. It is very important that we uh, realize that it is not that it's in this war uh, only our side of the Uh, negotiation table is hurting from this war. Um, I was more than uh, 12 years um, the president of the Afghan Red Crescent Society and I saw uh, the violence really hurting both sides. The, the difference was that uh, our side, because it was happening in the area that the cameras had access and it, w it could have been seen immediately and in a matter of minutes it was shown on television and it was announced on radio but I saw what was happening in the others, uh, to the uh, Taliban side also it was horrendous sometimes for killing one Talib and the entire household would have been hurt women would have been hurt children would have been killed So it is extremely important that we have we look at from both sides and then we give this verdict that the ceasefire or at least the um, I mean a good measure of reduction of violence is needed for both sides. And uh, my hope and my prayers goes for that moment that we really sit and talk about peace in a proper way and for the people of Afghanistan. Thank you, Dr. Barakat. Just wanted to mention that when we talk about inclusion, it's not only inclusion of women. It's inclusion of all sides of Afghanistan, the uh, inclusion of minority, the especially victim of war. And it's, uh, when we talked about the it's a victim of war, it's from both sides, from from uh, Republic side and from Taliban side. We want to include both sides. If they are ready, we most welcome. Thank you very much. Would you like to respond to this? Um, I think most of the things have been said, um, except a few uh, probably uh, clarifications. Um, first of all, yes, the outlook of women and men from cities to the villages might look different, but their demand are the same. If you go from Kabul, travel to Herat, Kandahar, Badakhshan, Faryab, wherever, I don't know if you actually, these names resonate with you because probably most of you do not work in Afghanistan, but these are the provinces which have a diverse culture from each other. So if you travel to these places, you ask a woman who wears a burqa, of what, she what her vision for her daughter or son is. She wears a burqa, but she wants her daughter and her son to go to school. And this is regardless of under which territory she lives. And listening to this is only the reason that uh, in some places actually, Taliban allowed um, uh, under their control, they allowed um, sc school girls to be open. And this is what the demand of the people of Afghanistan is now actually for the same reasons that uh, as negotiating on behalf of people of Afghanistan and keeping our uh, perspective uh, widen, we would like to reach an, a um, ceasefire agreement that will not only benefit us, the troops or whoever who are fighting, but benefit the people. We were in the negotiation table when a uh, war in Helmand, one of the provinces occurred. As a result, 35,000 people left their homes. Many people were killed from both sides, but also civilians. When the same day we had the negotiation with Taliban, when we shared some of these um, facts and figures with them, it was interesting to see that they also have the same understanding. So we speak the same language from a different perspective. And that's why we think it is important to talk, to share the differences, but then to agree on, on having differences. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, I'm afraid we, we need to bring it to a close because we're already behind schedule. And uh, I'd just like to wrap up by emphasizing the importance of where you concluded, dialogue. This is what it is all about. I hope in the future we'll be able to have this panel with the participation of women and others from all sides who are able to transmit to us the uh, picture as it is and engage in this finding this common ground because clearly we have a lot of commonality in here but we also unfortunately have different perspectives and the years of violence and the uh, uh, violation of rights that has happened over the years has made it worse to even uh, sit together and, and talk. Uh, usually in these events, when we, we do them, we get you know five, four, eight questions maximum. Here I'm overwhelmed by the questions I'm getting from those who are following us online, which means there is a lot of uh, appetite to engage and learn more about what you're doing. And also I'm conscious that we haven't given a fair chance to our colleagues from Yemen and Libya and Sudan uh, to engage with us in this session. Maybe we'll be able to do that later on. Uh, but I'd like to thank you all. Uh, thank especially those who've uh, attended in person. Uh, Dr. Amal Ghazal, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Your Excellency, the Ambassador. Your Excellencies, the members, members of the negotiation team. And of course, uh, for these wonderful four ladies that are for me uh, more of sisters than uh, professionals. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I hope that uh, your stay in Qatar will continue to be comfortable, but more importantly, opens avenues of dialogue. What we try to do here is just to make your voice heard and I'm sure that all sorts of people are following this discussion. I have, in fact, received uh, uh, a message of congratulations to all of you from His Excellency Ambassador Khalil Zad uh, from the United States, who could not follow in time, but he has sent a message. His uh, Excellency Ambassador Mutlaq Qahtani, who is the special envoy from Qatar, also sent his uh, blessing and uh, congratulations for, for the, uh, having this opportunity. Uh, we are here at the center. We see it as part of our mandate to try and enlarge that space of common understanding. And uh, in the future, I hope that our friends and our counterparts, people that you are negotiating with, will also feel the same um, interest and feel that, as Sister Fatma put it incredibly well, all have suffered, and it is time to end this suffering. The world has moved on, and unfortunately, in the Muslim world, we seem to uh, engage in far too many of these conflicts that really have got to be resolved. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will continue the conversation later. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our team, uh, those who've done the translation, Abdel Warith, Thank you very much, and uh, our translators upstairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mesa and the rest of the team. Take care. Bye-bye.